Hey guys, my name is Jason with Knob Baker Mining and Metals. And on today's video, I'm going to take this quartz gold ore I found in an old abandoned gold mine. I'm going to crush it up. I'm going to smelt it down and we're going to find out how much gold is in it. But to get everybody caught up, I'm going to start from the very beginning right after this shot and I'll show you where I got the ore from. And then later in the video, we'll get it all crushed up and get the gold out. And on today's video, we're back here in another gold mine. So let's go see if we can do a little high grading and find some golden quartz. We are in what's called a stope. And a stope is where they mined out the vein. And it's essentially like a big cave at this point. And so I'm going to try and walk and film at the same time. And I've got a couple lights. I know you guys have been on me about lights underground. So hopefully this is a little bit better lighting. But there is the, the vein they were working. Hanging wall is above you, where the miners would hang their lanterns off of, hence hanging wall. And foot wall is where your feet go. Pretty self-explanatory. And the old miners came in here, they mined out the vein, they left pillars here that hold up the ceiling, essentially, hold up the hanging wall. And they mined out this big, huge cave, essentially. And the only thing holding up the whole mountain over my head are these pillars they left. And so today, I want to come in, see if we can do a little high grading. I like to stay away from the pillars. You don't want to be, be picking at the pillars because they hold up the roof. But over here on the face, around the edge of the stope is pretty safe because you don't have a lot of exposure. Now, a little word of caution here. These old mines, this is well over 100 years old. These wooden things here are called stalls. And they put those in to hold up this big, nasty chunk of hanging wall that's about to fall off. And it hasn't moved in a hundred and something years, but that wood's a hundred years old too. So you do not want to be messing around underneath that stuff because any little vibration, just me talking, if you bump it with your hat or you, you know, rub your butt on it the wrong way, that whole big chunk could come falling down right in your head. So we want to stay away from stuff like that. But there's some good spots back over here. I can stay away from that chunk there by sneaking over here. So I'm going to work in here a little bit. I don't know if you can see from here, but there's the quartz vein. It's about three feet wide there. And then this one, this vein dips about 25 or 30 degrees to the north. And they were historically harder to work when they were shallow dipping because gravity's not working in your favor. You gotta work to get all the muck running down into a draw point and slush it or whatever you want to do with it to get it to your ore bin. See here, see that? Look at that stall right there. It's all wet here. That thing's just terribly rotted out. So I'm going to stay away from him. We'll go down here. Whereas I did a video a couple weeks ago where I was working on a vertical vein, more or less vertical. And those are really nice because gravity's working in your favor and you can just, when you blast, it all heads down into a pile and it's easy to muck it up. This looks like a little transfer way here. Looking back up the stope where we just were. See, if you, if you shot up there, you gotta have someone work it all the way down this stope this transfer level and that's just that just gets hard 
So let's we'll walk our way down this these tracks and see where they end up. All right, we're working our way down the tracks here. Here on the right, looks like they backfilled with a bunch of waste, a bunch of muck. But here looks like a little, a little stope again. And yeah, there's some vein on the wall there. There's a bunch of quartz. Looks like the vein gets all screwed up right in here. But over in here, what does this look like? There's some, there's some nice looking vein there. What else we got over here? There's some more vein. What do we got here? That's some good. That's some good looking stuff. So you've got a vein all the way up to the hanging wall. And then you've got, I don't know, a bit kind of a big rusty patch there in the middle. And the vein works down to the foot wall here. That vein's probably three and a half feet wide. But I'm kind of liking this little zone right in here. See that, that flat little, it almost looks like a vein within a vein. Let's get up here, see if we can get a closer look. But there's definitely some mineralization going on there. I like this big rusty patch. I don't know if that's sulfides or what. But oftentimes, and in some mines they talk about having multiple zones of enrichment or mul multiple flushes of fluid through the system. And so, let me back up so you can see a little bit what I'm talking about. So I'm gonna make up a little story here about how this may have formed. So this first flush of quartz, this first burst of fluid came off some magma chamber probably, uh, maybe miles away, shot into a crack into the, into the mountainside. Probably wasn't a mountain at that point, it was probably buried two or three miles under the surface. But it shot into the, the country rock the surrounding rock solidified into a nice big three foot wide quartz vein. And then there may be two, three, maybe four different fluid enrichment episodes where maybe you had the top one came in and emplaced and then it broke again and this little thin one came in and emplaced and then it broke again and shot some more into the, the foot wall area, or maybe this all came in at once and then shot this, this little band in at the very last. But that's, that's you know, uh, again, I'm making, up, I'm making up stuff, but that's definitely a possibility of how this vein could have been emplaced. And then over millions of years, the whole crust uplifted, turned into mountains, Everything else eroded away, and then the veins outcropped on the surface so the old miners could find them. Let's keep moving back along over here. We'll go on a little geology field trip here. But there's some really good looking stuff over here. Right in right in this area, there's there's that that little band so I can get the light right so you can see it and oftentimes going back to those two or three different fluid episodes the gold may have only came in in the in the very last one you know gold doesn't like to come out of, of uh, solution it's the last thing to go it's the very last thing to get enriched oftentimes in these in these hydrothermal systems and so you may have had a bunch of bull quartz essentially come in and place itself in this vein. And then the last little squeeze, almost like a, pardon the language, but like a little wet fart into the last little crack of this vein system. And that may be where all the gold is. And, and the, my experience has been on these big vein systems like this, you go and you look for the stuff that's, that's an anomaly. You look for the stuff that's a little bit different looking. More sulfides are always a good idea. To, to start picking around there, but when you're starting to high grade 
or look for enrichment zones in these veins, you want to look for the things that are, that are out of place or a little bit different. Sometimes along the foot wall or along a wall is a good place to start. But let me go get some of my tools and we'll see if we can work some of this vein here and find some gold today. Well, hopefully the lighting is good enough down here where we can kind of see what's going on. But I got my stuff down here. I'm going to get my hammer drill out and I'm just going to work along right along this little seam here that we looked at earlier. And I'm just going to chip along. And the important thing is don't get, don't convince yourself that the high grade is there if it's not. Work a little bit on it. If you don't see gold, move to a different spot. You're, you're not married to this spot. If it's not there, it's not there. And you've got a limited amount of time. I got a couple hours up here today. So I wanna just chip away at what I got. See, no, it's not there. I'll work up in the hanging wall, work down the foot wall. I'll move around in the stope some. But don't get so caught up that you think you know where the gold should be and you spend all your time and you don't find anything. So. Let me get the tools going and we'll see. I'll chip some off here and see what we can find the first five, 10 minutes. If we don't find anything, we'll do something different. All right, I got my hammer drill here. I'm just gonna work around this spot. I got a little spot cleared here, so I'll, I hopefully will know which rocks are mine that I chipped off. Let's see what happens here. Holy. All right, there's enough quartz dust. I'm going to put my respirator on. Oh, it's hard. It's really hard. Let me try something different. I'm going to try these feather and wedges again. They've worked really well for me in the past. And this stuff is just so hard that I can't chip anything off with my hammer drill. So let's see if I can wedge some off with these. Uh. All right, well, I got my hole deep enough. So let's try these feather and wedges. And thank you again to Dan Hurd for turning me on to these. These are pretty cool. So let me see if I can get some quartz off this wall. All right, well, let me see if I can film here without getting my my camera shadow in the shot. But here's, you can maybe see it a little bit more defined here. Here's that, that uh, little zone we were looking at. And we just dropped off our first piece. And right there is a little piece of gold. 
And right in there is a little piece of gold. So I, I like I like this. I really like this spot. This is really, really good. Uh, it's not necessarily super heavily mineralized, but it's got all the banding and all the all the all the telltale signs. I don't know how to describe it to you, but it's really good looking and we found gold in it, so that's even better. Um, so I'm gonna follow it along here. Here's another spot where it kind of outcrops again. So I may drive a, a wedge back in here and pop this off. And then uh, down here's our piece. I'm gonna break that up with a hammer and we can take a look. But there's a little piece of gold right there where my thumb is. So let me let me break this all up and see if we can get uh, some some better some better surface area on it. Let's see what's inside that dude there. Okay, let's see what we got in here. So I just bust it. Okay, what do we got here? Let me take a look and I'll show you if I find anything cool. Well, here's a couple chunks, lots of sulfides in there. Let's see if I can get my light so it's not washing out the. There you go. Lots of sulfides. So that's always a good sign. And then. This little guy, hold on, let me find it again. Right. <laughs> uh, let's see if I can get it. Right down right about where my finger is, just to the right there. There's some gold right in there. So we're in a good spot. Let's see if we can find some more. Now I'm putting all this good stuff this high grade in a in a uh, sandbag here and another thing i've learned is when you hike into an old mine like this you only get to take the stuff that you really like so make sure you're only getting the good stuff and you're not hiking out a bunch of stuff that's not worth anything but i'm going to work on getting my feather and wedge out of here and then i might move like i said back over here and work on this little patch here all right well now i'm going to try and work this big long crack here, and maybe put a couple feathered wedges in there, see if I can wedge out a good chunk of this wall and see what we got. All right, well, just like the Egyptians did, I guess. The feathers are uh, perpendicular to the crack, so it's gonna force that chunk out. My only concern is hopefully I have the, the holes deep enough. So here we go. Take my earplugs out so I can hear it if it's cracking. Oh yeah, it's coming. So one of the things about this quartz is it's terribly abrasive and really, really hard. And so the problem with that hammer drill is I only have so many batteries, so I have a very limited number of holes I can drill, and I can't drill, I, I can't just drill 12 inch holes everywhere, so I gotta be real selective about it. But I think one of the things about having it real hard and real brittle is it breaks real easy. So that's nice. Yeah. There we go. Oh, now see that one bottomed out. I'm gonna put that in my pocket before I lose it in the dark. And really, you just need, I mean, it, 
The feather and wedges, you don't need them to break the rock all the way out. You just need to get a big enough crack to where you can get, now I can get it here with my chisel or my rock hammer. Let's see, it should just pop right, it should just pop right off, let's see. Oh yeah, okay, there's the piece I want. For starters, it's right there. Oh, when I drilled this top hole, it was almost all quartz, just white quartz dust coming out. And when I drilled this hole, into our nice little spot. Yeah, it's black, just sulfides, tons of sulfides. Hey, right, well, that last spot, I didn't find any more gold. So I'm gonna move over a little bit. I'm about 10 feet over from where we were last. And I'm gonna work this zone right in here and see if I can find any more gold. And I like that feather and wedge so much, I'm gonna try feather and wedge back up here, but, I need, I need to have somewhere for it to go. And, and with this little curve here, I don't know if I have enough force to, to enough, enough hole to push that into that hole. So we'll see, I'll do a hole, cut maybe two holes real close and see if I can get that, that slab to flop out of there. All right, well, we've got our feather wedge in there. I did a little work trying to chisel off as much of this stuff as I could. I don't have high hopes for this. Let's see how it goes. There's some cracking. Not enough. So I need another one. I'll put another one in down here maybe. I really want to get up by this hanging wall. But I don't know if I can find a little find a little spot for a wedge. Here's another question for you. I mentioned this earlier. Feather and wedges, which is the wedge part? Is this the wedge? And these are the feathers? Or is this the wedge and this the feather? Leave me a comment. Let me know which one's which so I can get my nomenclature right here. But whichever one it is, they work pretty good in the right application. All right, well, let's see if I can get this. Here's my feather and wedge or wedge and feathers, <laughs> whichever, whichever way that goes. But then I was looking right up there. See that little piece of gold right at the end of my fingertip there? Man, oh man, I gotta get that. So, it's it's in here. I just gotta, just gotta figure out a way to get it out really hard. Well, I moved over to a different spot and I found a little quartz ledge sticking out of the floor here that I really like the look of. There's some, some shiny stuff up in here. So let me see if I can wail away on this a little bit and see if I can get some a fresh face going. Let me see what we got here. There we go. So I don't know if you can see it in there. Very mineralized. There's a little bit of free gold right down along here around those sulfides. So that's going in the bag. What else we got here? More sulfides, there's some gold down in here. 
It's like there's a little band of it kind of right in, right in this zone here. What else we got here? I'll put that in the bag. Oh, I got a big, big chunk here. Oh boy. Hang on. I don't want to get it stuck in there. Junk out of the way here. I need to bring a pry bar with me. Okay, we'll set that aside to look at later. It's just, it's just hanging in there. Come on out of there. All right. Now what do we got here? Let's get this thing broken up. Oh. Nothing there. Oh, look at that piece. Look at all those shinies. Now, a lot of this is uh, pyrite, like I mentioned, iron pyrite. Oh, there's a bunch of gold right there. Right there, laced along. Right along that pyrite. Yeah, he's going in the bag. Oh, dang. There's more right in here. Can you see it? It's like it's like it's right right at the end of the of the sulfides. Ooh, nice stuff. Nice stuff. Put it in the bag. Put it in the bag. What do we got here? Quartz. Yeah, look at all that. Look at that. Let's see if I can break some of that off. Now you're starting to get excited and you just want to take it all. There's a little more right there. All right, well. There's what I'm working. We'll put all our good stuff in the bag and then we'll take it down and crush it up.
here it is right out of that little jaw crusher and it's mostly quarter inch minus there might be a few pieces in there that are half but now the next step is I'm gonna weigh this so then at the end of the video we can do an ounces per ton calculation to figure out how much gold is in a ton of that material there's our scale zeroed Dump it in the We have 6.1 kilograms. Now the next step to crush it up real fine is going to be to run it through this Bico or Bico pulverizer. And this thing's pretty cool. I think it's just like a little grain mill. It's got a stationary plate here. This plate spins with the motor and they come in real close tolerance right there. And so as they spin together, you feed the material down here and it crushes till it can come out that little slot right there. I ran it through a kind of a coarse pass, and that's what I showed you earlier, and then I ran it through a finer pass, and man, it just comes out super fine. So that thing does a really, really nice job. Now we have all the gold crushed up and liberated from the quartz. Now I gotta get the gold concentrated. And normally I would do this on my shaker table with a bigger sample. But because we only have, I don't know, 10, 12 pounds here, six kilograms, whatever that is, I'm just gonna pan it out. So I'll just grab some sample like that in a pan. I'll pan it into this bigger gold pan. There's our tailings catch basin here. And I'll, when all that's panned down, we'll have the concentrates in the pan. And then we can see what we got. Let's see if I can do this here. Here's all three of our pans worth. Took me three pans. But there you can kind of see the gold. So that's not too bad for 10 pounds or 12 pounds, huh? And I'm hoping that there's quite a bit more down in here in this in these sulfides. I can get them up there so you can see them a little bit better, but. Oh, 14 grams. That is not very much. Okay, we've got 28 grams of soda ash. We've got about five grams of potassium nitrate, five grams of silica sand, and five grams of borax. We'll get that all mixed around there. And normally I would add a collector metal, but I kind of want to see if there's enough gold in there just to collect down at the bottom by itself, act as its own collector metal. So we'll give this a shot and see how it turns out. I got a new crucible here. <laughs> Barely comes up a quarter of the way. So we'll get that in the furnace. I'm going to let it get up to temperature, get all molten, and then I'm going to add an iron nail in there and the iron will eat up all the iron sulfide, which will be soluble in our basic slag because I added all that soda ash. And then hopefully we'll have a little gold button down at the bottom, slag on top, and we'll pour it into our cone mold and we'll be able to separate our gold from our slag.
All right, guys, well, I'm about to go pour the panning tailings in that number 20 crucible that we mixed up earlier. It's really, really full. I've got about half the panning tailings in there, plus the flux. So I've got uh, six, eight, 10 pounds worth of stuff in that crucible. So it's gonna be a big pour. It's gonna overflow the cone mold, but all the matte and any gold and silver is gonna go down and sink right to the bottom, even though all the light slag is flowing over the top of that cone mold. So that's our plan. Let's see if it works. Well, that didn't go quite as I planned. I think there was so much silica in there that it was super thick. It, the, if you have too much silica and not enough borax to thin it out, it just makes it a real thick, massy, gooey mess. So I don't have real high hopes that we got a whole bunch of stuff down at the bottom of this cone. There would have to be a whole bunch of mat to work its way down through that gooey, soupy mess. But We'll see, it, it poured really thick, it was really hot. I don't know if I'm gonna do that again. I gotta find a better way to pour that so I'm not standing right over the top of it. Um, but let's break this out of here and see if we got any metal at the bottom. It's super glassy. My whole idea here was that we had 14 grams of concentrates from about six kilograms of material top. And that's like a 0.2% concentration ratio. So it's way, way more than normal. Usually with the shaker table, we get about uh, one in a hundred, so 1% or 2%. So my theory was is that there was be enough sulfides in this stuff left over that I lost from panning that they would form a mat and collect any precious metal and bring it down to the bottom and form a little tip of the cone here. So let's see, still really hot. Is there any mat? Nope, there's nothing down there. There's a few bigger pieces of quartz, but there's nothing down there in the bottom. No mat, no metal. No, nothing. So that didn't work like I hoped. But it sure is glassy. And I, it's not like I see a bunch of mat in there. It's not like there's pieces of stuff suspended in the slag. It's, it's nice and clear, a few little bubbles. So anyway, that didn't work. But let's talk about the good news here with our bead. This is 
what we started with in weight, 0 0.006 metric tons, or 6 kilograms. We ended up with a 0.445 grams of gold. So when you divide those two, you end up with 74 grams per ton, or 2.38 troy ounces per ton of gold in a ton of rock. So that is really, really rich stuff. Really, really good results on that one. Well, you thought I was done, but I'm just, I'm so curious about this stuff, this slag. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the slag, I'm gonna clean out the, all the stuff over there in that bin, and we'll put it through the jaw crusher and the little pulverizing mill again, and then I'll pan it out and see if there's any tiny little beads of metal or mat or, or gold in there, and we'll see if maybe it just didn't all collect down at the bottom of the cone, maybe it's little beads of metal suspended in the slag. So let's get it crushed up and see if we can find any metal. And here we are all crushed up. It's pretty fine. Hopefully any little gold beads in there are liberated. Now let's go pan this stuff out and see what we got. All right, we'll do a quick and dirty pan here of the slag and see what's in there. It sucks up the water nice. And I don't know if you can tell in the video, but the slag and all the dust is real green. And that's from all the iron it looks like it's black when it's in big pieces, and, but if you look right at the edge or you crush it really, really small, it's, it's kind of a pretty emerald green or like a peridot green. This is everything I had all panned down. Let's take a look at what we got here. Huh. like a bunch of little metal balls. There, can you see that? Let me see if they're magnetic. Let's see if I can pull them with a magnet. Okay, a little cow magnet in a bag here. Ooh, a lot of, a lot of it's coming. A lot of steel. All right, now all the steel's gone. And there's still a ton of metal stuff in there. Yeah, a bunch of little tiny gold balls. Yeah, let me see if I can get a close-up here for you. There's some gold for sure. And then a bunch of silvery stuff. Silvery little metal balls. So let me see if I can get that sucked up in, in cupel it and see if if any of its precious or how much precious metals are there. Alright, so this is how we're gonna do this. I've got it cleaned up here, so all the heavies are up here in this corner. And I'm gonna take the snuffer bottle. I don't want to smelt it all down again. That just takes too long. I just want I'm just gonna cupel it and see what we got. So I'm gonna suck up as much as I can here without getting a bunch of slag. If you get a bunch of slag in the cupel, it kind of screws everything up. But I want all that silvery stuff. I don't know if that's matte or metal or what. So I'm just going to carefully suck up what I can. All right, now there's pretty much just slag in there. All of our goodies are here in the snuffer bottle. All right, now I've got a little paper towel there. And I'm going to take our snuffer bottle, turn it upside down, and shake all that stuff right down to the tip there. And then just very carefully get it all leaked out here into our 
shop towel. So all our goodies are down there now. Now I'm going to take it and just wring it out. Wring as much water as I can out of there. And all of our good stuff will be right down here at the bottom. And then I'm just going to put that directly in the cupel furnace with a little bit of bismuth and let it go to town and it'll oxidize all that all those base metals out of there and leave us with the precious metals now I just put our packet in there I'm going to reuse that cupel you're probably not supposed to do that but I don't want to waste one for this little experiment so we'll let that go and see what we come up with alright let's have a look here Holy moly, that's a huge bead. Wow. Nice. Well, let's get it cooled down and have a look. Well, there it is. Well, there's the bead. I don't know if you can read that. It says 0.211. And it's definitely more silvery colored than our last one. But that's a significant amount of precious metals that were in the slag. Uh, let me think about this for a minute. And there's comparing them. The one on the right is from... The panning concentrates, the one on the left is from the slag. So here's a close-up look at those two beads. And you can really see the texture and the color difference. Again, the one on the right is the one from the panning concentrates, the one on the left is from the slag. But let's do some math here, figure out how much gold we really have in our stuff. Well, this really changes things. So that a uh, bead from the slag weighed 0.211 grams and I did about half of the panning tailings when I smelted those. So you have to multiply those by roughly two. This is all kind of winging it here. So if you had all the gold in the panning tailings, it'd be four, uh, 0.422 grams. I figure it's about 75% gold roughly. So there's 0.317 grams of gold in the panning tailings. When you multiply or when you figure out the grams per ton, there's an additional 52.8 grams per metric ton that I lost. That's 1.7 troy ounces. So when you add them all together, this number and this number, you end up with 126.8 grams per ton or a little over 4 troy ounces per ton. So I don't know if I'm really happy that my ore is almost twice as rich as I thought it was, or if I'm really disappointed that I lost almost half the gold in my sample plan here. All right, so let's review here. So I lost a bunch of gold in the panning tailings. I don't know if that's because I was sloppy at panning, because the stuff wasn't liberated, or because I panned out too much of the heavy sulfide concentrates that I should have kept and smelted with the panning con. So there, those are some of the possibilities for where I lost the, gold, lost the gold to the tailings. The other thing that I want to point out is when I took the panning tailings and smelted them all down, I really should have used a collector metal. There was, there was hardly any gold for the volume that I was doing. And that's, that's why you use collector metals. Those little tiny pieces of gold just can't find each other in that huge number 20 crucible to get together and then come down to the bottom as a, a, a mass of, of precious metals. So that's the whole reason behind a collector metal. Also, the thing that was kind of hamstringing me there was I didn't have enough borax in the melt. My crucible was too full by the time that I had it all molten and it was just too thick. So even if you did have a uh, significant amount of collector metal, there's a, there's a chance that some of those collector metal pieces could have been suspended in the slag anyway. So that is why that I didn't get a bead or a, a collection of precious metals down at the bottom when I poured. 
So I learned my lesson there. But I'm really excited that I found a spot underground that has four ounces a ton of gold. And I am super excited to get back there this spring and summer and see if I can high grade some more, but also see if I can get underground and do a little mining. So I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Be sure to check out my channel for more videos of underground exploration and sampling. And stay tuned for more videos. So thanks again, and we'll see you on the next one.